This week has seen the leadership of South Sudan head to the Vatican for a retreat diplomacy in an attempt to heal bitter divisions. Plus, Ethiopia passes tough laws banning advertising of alcoholic drinks so as to promote healthy living in the country. This is Africa Focus. Here's a peek of the stories in store today. South Sudan holds breath as Frazel Peace faces crucial test. Rwanda 25 years on, we meet the Tutsi man reaching across ethnic divides in Rwanda. Athletics powerhouse Kenya in a race against time to be ready for the World Junior Athletics Championships. I'm Lenny Rashid and our sign language interpreter is Teresia Washira. Now before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. The people want to build a new Sudan. Were the words written on a giant banner unfurled at a large protest in Khartoum on Tuesday as people took to the streets calling for longtime ruler President Omar al-Bashir to step down. Since December 19th, Sudan has been rocked by persistent protests sparked by the government's attempt to raise the price of bread and by fuel and cash shortages. The demonstrations have developed into the most sustained challenge to Bashir's rule since he took power three decades ago. Bashir, a former paratrooper who is being sought by international prosecutors for alleged war crimes in the country's western Dafar region, has refused to step down and said his opponents need to seek power through the ballot box. On Tuesday, the head of the main opposition party, Sadiq al-Mahadi, said that around 20 people had been killed and dozens wounded in dawn attacks on a city outside Sudan's defense ministry by protesters calling for Bashir to step down. Algeria's parliament appointed its upper house chairman, Abdelkader Ben Salah, as interim president on Tuesday, following the resignation of ailing Abdelaziz Bouteflika after weeks of mass demonstrations against his rule. His appointment is in keeping with Algeria's constitution, but protesters who want sweeping democratic reforms oppose figures like Ben Salah, a close associate of Bouteflika, and his inner circle who dominated Algeria for decades. Shortly after the announcement in parliament, hundreds of protesters took to streets in central Algiers, some chanting, Ben Salah, go away. Upon stepping down, Bouteflika promised that elections would be held after 90 days as part of a transition, he said, would usher in a new era. As per the Algerian constitution, Ben Salah will remain interim president until new elections are held. Local media reported that police used tear gas to disperse crowds. Tens of thousands of mainly African migrants are caught up in the violence in Libya amid fears that some could be used as human shields or forcibly conscripted as fighters, United Nations agencies said on Tuesday. Many languish in poor conditions in detention centers, having been arrested on arrival in Libya after a desert trek or forcibly returned there by patrols in the Mediterranean for boatloads of migrants seeking European shores. Casualties from the Battle of Tripoli mounted on Tuesday as a group lawyer to Islamic State killed three people in Libya's remote center, showing how militants may exploit renewed chaos. Officially, some 5,700 refugees and migrants are detained in Libya, but many more are in the custody of armed groups, according to the UNHCR. An American tourist and her driver have been rescued and harmed after being kidnapped in a national park in southwestern Uganda last week. Ugandan authorities said on Monday. 35-year-old Kimberly Sue Endercott was abducted by gunmen at Queen Elizabeth National Park near the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo on April 2nd. The kidnappers later demanded a ransom of $500,000 for her release. Ugandan police spokesman Fred Enanga said both the tourist and the guide were released after the kidnappers realized the implicit threat of use of force by Uganda security agencies. And Nanga said the authority was not involved in any arrangements to pay a ransom either with the family or the camp manager as police and government of Uganda does not encourage payment. The gunsman identity is unclear, but the area where the abduction took place was once roamed by fighters belonging to an anti-Kampala rebel group, the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, which is now mostly dormant. The group is still believed to have camps in eastern Congo, Abductions and related attacks on tourists are rare in Uganda, and the last such incident occurred in 1999. 
Some 2,000 people have been forced to flee to the northeastern Nigerian city of Maiduguri ahead of a major offensive against Boko Haram, emergency services and residents told AFP on Tuesday. Nigerian troops herded residents of Jakana village into trucks and ferried them 40 kilometers to a displacement camp in the Bono state capital. Evacuated residents were taken to Bakasi IDP camp by the military for their safety as a result of ongoing up operations to flush out insurgents in the area. Bakasi is one of several camps in the city housing thousands of displaced people who live in squalid shelters and rely on food handouts from aid agencies. Jakana lies on a non-crossing route for ISWAP fighters moving between their camps in the Benisheke forest area of Bono and their hideouts in the Buni Yadi area of neighboring Yobe state. In 2011, South Sudan became Africa's newest state after its citizens opted to secede from the north. However, their joy would be short-lived as the country became embroiled in a civil strife in 2013. More than 4 million people have since been displaced as a result of the conflict. Some, though, like Chol Deng and her family, are returning back to the country, encouraged by a six-month law in fighting as a peace deal holds for the first time since 2015. Back home after five years in exile in neighboring Sudan. Chol Deng, her husband, and their five children fled South Sudan's second city of Malakal to escape the atrocities ravaging the country in 2014. People died, lots of them. People could literally walk on dead bodies across Malakal. Her family has sought refuge in Udia in the northeast of the country, a quiet village on the border with Sudan and Ethiopia. Refugees from across the country are staying here, waiting to see if the peace deal holds before returning to their homes. We were being killed in Juba. We were shot at by people we didn't know at around 3 a.m. They burned down houses, killed our kids. It's the first time since 2015 that a peace deal has lasted in South Sudan. The power-sharing deal will be the third attempt to reconcile Salva Kiir and his opponent, Riek Machar. Their rivalry kicked off a civil war in 2013 that left around 400,000 dead and nearly 4 million displaced. In this camp in Juba, residents say they are waiting for the formation of the unity government that's meant to be taking place next month. When the peace comes, everyone wants to go back home, where there shall be no killing or beating. Then we can return home and stay in peace. That's all. Everyone's waiting to see if Riek Mashar returns to Juba as planned in May. A prior peace deal collapsed just months after his return in 2016, sparking even worse violence. We should be further along and we are getting a little concerned that the momentum is starting to slow. Uh, and momentum slows, frustration sets and might lead to anger and then who knows after that. But aside for some small gestures, such as the freeing of opposition prisoners, progress so far has largely stalled. Reconciliation in Rwanda since the 1994 genocide has come about partly due to state policy but also thanks to the courage of certain individuals who have been able to reach out across divides. Thomas Ntashutimwe is one such individual, a member of the persecuted Tutsi minority who has worked tirelessly for reconciliation in his village. Tomar lived in Mutete, 40 kilometers north of Kigali. The father of five is well respected in his village. He is seen as a figure of reconciliation. During the 1994 Rwandan genocide, more than 800,000 people were killed, mostly from the Tutsi minority ethnicity. All of Tomar's relatives fled the village, but he chose to stay behind. I saw no reason to leave. As long as the attackers were my neighbors, my friends, people with whom I shared everything, it was inconceivable that they could kill me. He lost most of his relatives in the bloodshed, though he himself miraculously escaped death. Tomar felt his calling after the genocide lay in promoting reconciliation. He encouraged people in ever greater numbers to return and pray at the local church. Pushing his efforts in all parts of life, 
this Tutsi man decided to marry a Hutu woman from the majority ethnicity. While people thought I was going to marry a Tutsi survivor, I chose a person of a different ethnicity. It was a personal decision. Nobody forced me. It was my choice, and it was a crucial step. At the time, mixed ethnicity marriages were very rare and not seen positively. But for Tamar and his wife, it was essential to overcome these ethnic divides. The future of their country seemed to depend on it. The couple became an example in their village. They see our home as a role model, observing how we conduct ourselves in the community. We are sometimes contacted to help other conflicted households. But the deeply ingrained lines of ethnic division can take a long time to fade. In an attempt to speed up progress, laws have been introduced that prohibit the mentioning of ethnicity in public. It is a potential step towards reconciliation, but the real progress will have to come from the citizens of Rwanda. Coming up after the break. We are in Portugal's Cova do Moura slum, where a vibrant Cape Verdean culture is thriving. Don't touch that dial. We're about to take a water break. Keep it switch. Welcome back. In case you've just joined us, you're watching Africa Focus, and today's sign language interpreter is Tedesia Washira. Now, athletes are training hard for the upcoming World Junior Athletics Championships that are set to be hosted by Kenya in just over a year. However, preparations for the event have stalled amid construction delays and the government's failure to deliver the promised upgrades to sports facilities in the country. This has led to athletes going to great lengths to train for sport that has brought so much glory to the country. Having topped the medal standings four times at the IAAF World Under-20 Championships, Kenya has been given the hosting rights for next year's competition. This will provide an opportunity for aspiring athletes to showcase their talent, as well as show that the country has the potential to stage international athletics competitions. As athletes are training hard, preparations for the event have stalled amid construction delays and the government's failure to deliver the much needed upgrades on various sports facilities in the country. Elias Kiptum Mahindi is a two-time winner of the Linz Marathon in Austria. He has been training in the high altitude town of Iten for the past decade. Given the fact that now Kenya will be hosting the World Under 20 Championship uh, next year in Nairobi, so we have a, risk, a very big risk of losing the, the titles to other countries like Ethiopia or Ugandans who are now coming up very fast. Situated some 2,400 meters above sea level, Iten has been the training base for elite athletes, including two-time world and Olympic champion David Rudisha, former world marathon record holder Wilson Kipsang, and current women-only marathon record holder Mary Keitani. The athletes themselves cannot train on the road because it's because of the hard ground. You realize now that we train on the tarmac road, it's risky of athletes getting injuries. When Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta was first elected in 2013, he listed nine stadiums that were to be built or refurbished. Among them was the famous Kamarini Stadium in Iten, and the two big stadiums in Eldoret and Kapsabet, both named after Kenya's legendary athlete Kipchoge Keino. Six years later, none of the stadiums are ready. We don't have a training facility. You realize that uh, for the last years we used to have a training ground here in Kamarin Stadium and of late now it is under construction, it has stalled, so all the athletes now are really suffering, we don't have an alternative track to train. In Iten, the Kamarini Public Training Ground, a track that has launched the careers of multiple champions and driven Kenya's dominance in middle and long distance running for over half a century is closed. Athletes are forced to travel to running tracks in Eldoret, some 35 kilometers away, or in the neighboring town of Tambach, 11 kilometers away. As the clock ticks down to next year's championships, athletes point out that delayed government plans to upgrade facilities risk damaging a sport that brings intense national pride. 
Like for example, uh, Kipchoge Stadium has taken now over, it's almost 10 years. And we, we are worried also if Kamarin is going to take 10 years before it's completed, then where will be the athletic athletes in, in this country? Where are we? Are we be able to compete well with Ethiopians? Are we going to compete well with Ugandans who are coming up very fast? It is so hard. In 2018, Kenya lost the hosting rights for Chan. According to the Confederation of African Football, the country was not in a position to host the event as the stadiums were not ready in time. The government insists, however, that it is doing what it can. Frustrated athletes have taken matters into their own hands and have launched a fundraising campaign to build a basic track near Iten. Egypt's capital city, Cairo, is an overpopulated mega city of more than 20 million people. The country's financial and administrative hub is already plagued by monster traffic jams, widespread waste problems, and rampant pollution. And now packs of stray dogs are adding to the city's challenges. An overpopulated mega city of more than 20 million people. Cairo is already plagued by monster traffic jams, widespread waste problems and rampant pollution. Packs of stray dogs are only adding to the city's challenges. Complaints about dog attacks, exposure to rabies and in some cases even deaths over the years have triggered calls for the animals to be brought under control. Shahab Abdel Hamid, the head of Egypt's Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, says a bite from a dog carrying the rabies virus can be fatal within 24 hours as it damages the human's nervous system. I am talking about 60 or 70 death cases caused by dogs in one year. Some people who are not experts go on media outlets and claim that dogs only transfer one disease. But in fact, dog transmits many diseases. According to the Agriculture Ministry, there were around 400,000 cases of dog bites in 2017, up from 300,000 in 2014 and 231 people died over the past four years from the wounds they received, mainly as a result of rabies. Hilal, who had never feared dogs, having had several pets when growing up, was rushed to a nearby hospital, only to discover that he was the ninth person to be beaten by the same dog. When I went to the vaccination, I was on a waiting list. I was the ninth case to be beaten by the same dog. It seemed that the dog was around Roxy area, then he went somewhere else. There is no official data on the numbers of stray dogs, but activists say they are running loose in their millions. A survey by the SPCA showed that the number of stray dogs may reach up to more than 15 million. And those street dogs appear to fear the most crowded areas. They can be loud and aggressive in poorly lit and rubbish tuned suburbs. In November, a video widely circulated on social media showed a car hitting a teenager who was being chased by two stray dogs. Some animals are aggressive by nature, therefore we must get rid of them. In 2017, authorities killed more than 17,000 stray dogs following multiple complaints of dog disturbances and biting in Beni Suif, south of Cairo, according to an August report by the government's veterinary directorate. The Red Sea governor even offered 100 Egyptian pounds award to those who capture and hand over at least five strays. Animal rights defenders also accuse the government of killing dogs using a drug known as trichin, a chemical substance listed as unacceptable on animal welfare grounds for euthanasia by the World Organization for Animal Health. We are all human beings and we all love animals and have had pets in our homes before. It is just that such accidents have a different impact on each person and it affects us differently. Animal rights advocates have sought to offer solutions, actively removing dogs from the streets and giving them homes. Ahmed al Shobagi, 35, has opened two dog shelters in a desert area west of Cairo near the famed Giza pyramids. We are just a group of people who go to the streets, rescue injured stray dogs and cure them. 
we have staff that needs to be paid. We provide so many solutions that cost nothing, but no one listens or cares. Shobage contributes 40% to the funding of the shelters, while the rest comes from donations. Shobagi believes the solution lies in dog sterilization programs, providing rabies vaccinations and removing the garbage. The small country of Cape Verde is a former Portuguese colony. In 1975, the country, with a population of about half a million people, won independence from its colonial masters. Since then, thousands of Cape Verdeans have emigrated to Portugal. In most cases, they end up in Cova da Moura, a town that has the country's fifth highest crime rate. But that is not preventing them from practicing their vibrant culture. Hidden from the public eye, just a 20-minute drive from downtown Lisbon lies one of Portugal's most problematic neighborhoods, where police raids are frequent and mostly immigrant residents often speak of friends doing time in prison. No CCTV wants a sign at the entrance into Covadamora, but inside the slum, a vibrant Cape Verdean community cherishes and celebrates their home country of Africa's west coast with music, food and street art that may one day change the area's no-go reputation among Lisbon residents. For me, growing here was like growing anywhere else and being born here, the value I give to the neighborhood, it's different from other people that weren't born here. But at the same time, my view of Cova da Mora is the same as them. Love and mystic that we have for the neighborhood. Often compared to Brazil's favela slums, Covadamora's unsightly brick and concrete dwellings stretch across 16 hectares of hilly landscape on the outskirts of Lisbon. The municipality of Amadora, that includes Covadamora, has Portugal's fifth highest crime rate, with over 6,000 crimes in 2017. The possibility for us to be integrated in the Portuguese community in its full sense, it's not achieved because we are not allowed to get there. I think it's a bit because of that invisible wall or maybe some preconception that still exists or the discrimination that happens in education and employment. A case in 2015 has also attracted notoriety to alleged police brutality, with 17 officers facing charges of using excessive violence against members of the predominantly black community. Police declined to comment on the case as the trial is ongoing. Sitting meters away from the tiny room where he grew up, Cabral, who has been to prison before, and now organizes tours of Cavadomora, said direct contact with its people helps change visitors' perceptions of the slum, which he jokingly calls a more developed area of Cape Verde. Although Cabral believes the neighborhood is suffering from discrimination and struggles to offer the same education to their resident as in the rest of Lisbon, he hopes his children have the opportunity to go to university. I think the police see us with a preconceived idea. They have in them some kind of mental colonialism because the way they act here, it's not for sure the same as they act in Bairro Alto or any other place. Here, it's for sure completely different. It's much more violent and aggressive. The neighborhood is home to around 6,000 people, with the Cape Verdeans making up about three quarters. The owner of Coquiro, Maria Silva, cooked a richly flavored cachupa stew as she explains how the bar helps transmit the African culture. Saturdays and Sundays, we have many people from outside the neighborhood and also from here. They come to eat, to dance. People enjoy it. And for me, that's good because that's our culture. It was only in 1974 when the Canadian Revolution ended Portugal's dictatorship that the neighborhood became a hub for migrants coming from the former colonies in Africa. Living and moving here was terribly hard, but I had a year to adjust. I cried the entire year because I wanted to go back, but got accustomed, and here I am 40 years later. Migrants built illegal sheds and basic infrastructure, but there was no running water, sewage or electricity. Now study two or three story houses have replaced wooden shacks and the muddy street have been paved. But poverty is still visible, with the most residents taking up early shifts as construction and domestic workers in the capital. 
On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you. So make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268 and on Azan TV channel 138. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting of journeys. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.